Please welcome the president and CEO of N. Carter Therapeutics, Paul Hastings. Hello out there. Good morning to everybody. It does my heart good to look out today and see the largest biotech convention in the world back at full capacity. Thank you. In a short time, we've come an awful long way. Now, I've been involved in bio for more than two decades now, and the opportunity to chair this organization has been one of the highest honors of my professional life. When I began my tenure as bio chair, we were still only halfway through the worst global pandemic in a century. The demographics of COVID's death toll had finally awakened this nation to stark health disparities that exist based on race and socioeconomic backgrounds, and to the longstanding legacies of mistrust in our healthcare system. Now, COVID made millions of people viscerally understand the terrifying uncertainty of contracting a potentially deadly disease, especially if you are uninsured or working in the service sector, not from a laptop in the safety of your own home. Our eyes opened, our hearts broken, we went to work. Now today, 230 million Americans, 70% of us, have been fully vaccinated. We fought back against misinformation and disinformation to convince our friends and neighbors to protect themselves, their families, and their communities. We successfully lobbied Congress to require all insurers, public and private, to provide free COVID tests throughout the pandemic. Thanks in large part to our work, President Biden formally ended the national COVID emergency last month, even as our scientists continue researching how to help the millions still suffering from long COVID. Now, the last two years have seen other important progress. As chair, I helped BIO reconstitute our executive committee to create the most diverse board leadership in our organization's history. We included women and men of all backgrounds and orientations from both sides of the aisle, from all corners of the globe, from emerging companies, established companies, healthcare companies, and agricultural and environmental companies. We work well together because we respect our differences as we embrace our common cause, promoting innovation for patients and people. BIO's senior leadership should reflect the people and patients our companies exist to serve, and now it does. Now, as an industry, we've made major strides in diversifying clinical trials to include more patients from historically underrepresented groups. BIO built a new website to help these individuals find clinical trial opportunities that match their medical needs. We advanced our ability to use patient perspective data in clinical programs so the outcomes measured by the FDA are the ones that matter most to the patients we aim to help. And we continue the job our organization started, and for the first time in our nation's history, Congress finally capped the out-of-pocket costs that any senior must pay under Medicare at no more than $2,000 a year. And we spread those costs over an entire year so seniors aren't stuck with an astronomical deductible in January before they even take their first pill. President Biden highlighted this victory in his State of the Union address. But it was BIO that first brought this idea to Congress's attention and got it included in the original Senate finance package. And it was BIO that fought year after year to make our vision a reality for 1.4 million seniors stuck with catastrophic annual costs. So how do we achieve similar progress for the majority of US patients on private insurance? That's a much tougher question. BIO has logged countless hours on Capitol Hill explaining our complex reimbursement system, the difference between a drug's wholesale costs and patient deductibles and copays. The IRA, for the first time, instituted price controls on the wholesale cost of many popular medicines. 
now trying to control what the patient pays at the pharmacy counter by giving massive price discounts to payers and shadowy, shadowy middlemen in the value chain is like prescribing chemotherapy to treat COVID. It's the wrong medicine that will only make the patient sicker. Such policies do precious little to control patient costs while slashing the revenues that fuel our entire innovative enterprise. Biotech companies have many tools at our disposal that we can and must aggressively deploy to make our drugs affordable for patients. Rebates, discounts, copay assistance, compassionate use, and free drug programs for uninsured patients, and in my opinion, a sacred social contract whereby we facilitate rather than obstruct drugs going generic when patents expire. But our companies do not and cannot set the prices that patients pay for medicines in the United States. That's just not the way our system works. When US lawmakers slash wholesale drug costs in the name of helping patients afford their out-of-pocket responsibility, it is treating COVID with chemotherapy. It's a lose-lose for everybody except for insurers and PBMs already raking in record profits. But that message is very hard to fit on a bumper sticker in today's zero-sum politics of outrage and division. It is BIO's job to be that voice of reason, to help lawmakers understand how to pull the right levers for patients. Now at this moment, we're suffering through a bear market in the post-pandemic environment as our sector reels from the, most, uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, our most important lender. It's times like this when outstanding leadership is mission critical, when having a CEO like Rachel King is so important. So today, I'm also excited to share that my successor as bio chair is a leader for this very moment. He's a Yale-educated physician scientist of impeccable integrity who built an extraordinary company, one that's majority minority and majority female. Together, they went after a disease few others would tackle because most who suffer from it are either on Medicaid or living in Africa. Together, they delivered the first medication attacking the underlying cause of sickle cell disease, which has been ravaging communities of color for centuries. He's the perfect leader to help Bio meet the challenges of the new normal, to address healthcare disparities, to enlist new allies, to help rehabilitate our industry's reputation in the corridors of power. Now, it's my distinct privilege to welcome to the BioConvention stage Bio's new chairperson and my friend, a history maker and a difference maker, Dr. Ted Love. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for your many years of service to our industry and all the people around the world that we serve. You are a wonderful leader, friend, colleague, and the world of biotechnology is better because of you. I am honored to succeed you as chair of bio. I share your commitment to strengthening this industry and making sure that we are prepared to advance the life-saving innovations that our society so desperately needs. Like all of you here this morning, I am driven by our industry's massive and beneficial impact on people's lives, as well as the vital role we play in our economy. But we all know this is not appreciated by everyone. For decades, we've been fighting an uphill battle to justify our incredible work. Work that we advance at exceptional risk because we believe in a world of greater health, security, prosperity, and equality. It's fair to say that I assume this role 
from a somewhat different background than my many outstanding predecessors. My journey to this moment began in rural Alabama in the Jim Crow South. I was one of eight children growing up on a farm, and my parents worked hard to provide opportunities that they never had. My father had a sixth grade education. He fought in the Korean War. He worked in a warehouse to support us. My mother held down the house, which was quite an undertaking with five boys and three girls. Bless her heart. I learned so much from my parents, but I was inspired by the doctor in our segregated community. I decided that I too wanted to be a physician, to help others just as he had helped us. Years later, working just blocks from here at the Mass General Hospital, I saw how medical innovations drastically improve lives. Yet I also witnessed therapies and treatments failing to reach a segment of our society. It was disappointing, embarrassing, and even horrifying to see how our healthcare system could mistreat people of color and the most vulnerable. In particular, I'll never forget watching sickle cell patients endure egregious discrimination and unsympathetic health care. Ultimately, my personal experiences, coupled with great mentors, convinced me to move to a career in biotechnology to impact healthcare on a large scale. And that's what we do every day. But the public doesn't see the tremendous work, risk, and commitment needed to bring innovations to them. This is a huge and unfortunate disconnect. And while image may not be everything, it can be and has been consequential for us. It's long past time that we've reframed the narrative to better reflect the facts. To do this, we need to increase awareness of what we are actually achieving in our society by telling the powerful patient stories and standing up for science. It will require highlighting the possibilities of mRNA vaccines, gene therapy, crop editing, and the many other amazing technologies that we are investing in. It will require both uh, highlighting the opportunities and vulnerabilities of the innovation ecosystem, making it clear that the Inflation Reduction Act threatens our ability to deliver new life-saving innovations. Most of all, it will require building on our work to increase access. I joined Global Blood Therapeutics because I never forgot the suffering of sickle cell patients that I saw as a medical student. We developed Oxbrida as a breakthrough to treat the root cause of this insidious fatal disease. And last year, Pfizer acquired GBT to accelerate delivery of our innovative therapies to more patients around the world, particularly in Africa, India, and South America. Helping build GBT is one of the greatest achievements of my life. Yet ensuring that these therapies benefit the greatest number of people around the world will be my proudest. As an industry, when we support our, how we support our patient companies is critical. When it's done well, we are appreciated and often treasured. When sickle cell patients learn that GBT was a being, being acquired by Pfizer, the response was emotional. It was like losing a member of their family. 
but the community also saw the big picture. The possibilities that Pfizer could accelerate transformation of a long neglected disease. These will be my priorities as chair. Working to reset our industry image by telling the stories of the millions of patients and people who benefit from what we do. Championing access to our innovations. And of course, building on bio success and elevating our voice at the federal, state, and international levels. We have no choice. We must strengthen the policy and regulatory environment that allows great science to flourish and deliver brown, groundbreaking innovations for our society. I want to conclude by urging everyone, every one of you to think big. The mRNA breakthrough took years, but arrived in time for COVID. What nascent research is happening right now that will be critical and life-saving tomorrow? Biotech is about seeking opportunities and turning dreams into reality. We must stay true to these principles, keeping patients and society as our North Star. That will redefine belief in science and biotech, whether you're from rural Alabama or midtown Manhattan. We must all be leaders. Our future cannot rest with a small few. My ask to each of you is take a piece of this challenge back home with you. Put people and patients first. Break barriers and make sure we define our narrative. If we do, we will create a more prosperous and sustainable society and industry. We are fortunate. Not everyone gets to do good in their everyday job while also doing great for the world. But we do. So thank you for joining me in this critical endeavor with bio. Thank you.